Greetings everybody and welcome to the show. Today I'm continuing the spooky series as a follow-up to our Halloween specials. And boy, or girl, do I have an episode for you today. Dr. Kasia Spokowska, and I hope I've said that right, is an associate professor of Egyptology at Swansea University and director of the Ancient Egyptian Demonology Project for the Lieberhund Trust. Kasia's research is especially fascinating for me as it focuses on ancient Egyptian private religious practices. So not necessarily the practices of the elite, though it does include those, but the practices of everyday Egyptians. She's also a leading expert on dreams, gender, and the archaeology of magic in ancient Egypt. And her work provides unique insights into the mindset of the ancient Egyptian in ways we cannot accomplish just by looking at things like artifacts, for instance. Now, I should point out that when we mention magic in the context of ancient Egypt, it wasn't seen as something occult or weird in ancient Egyptian culture. Magic was as much a part of daily life and religion as any other practice and response to their often very frightening and dangerous world. It's not until much later with the advent of monotheism that we see a separation of magic from religion and the subsequent fall from grace of magic into something either false or seen as trickery or ungodly and unholy. Now, in this episode, we also touch on something that I've become much more aware of in my life of late, which is narcolepsy and what seems to be ancient Egyptian spells which may have been responses to this condition. If you or anyone you know is suffering from sleep paralysis, as portrayed in the recent Netflix show The Haunting of Hill House, though hopefully not quite that terrifying, or thinks that you may have narcolepsy symptoms, I've included a link in the show notes to Narcolepsy UK. That's a leading UK charity where you can get more information on this condition. But returning to the headline of the show, which is dreams and indeed nightmares and demons from ancient Egypt, I know that academic papers and books can be difficult to get hold of when you're not at a university. And Kasia has very kindly made many of her papers available for free on a website called academia.edu. As ever, you can find links in the show notes at Podbean, on Facebook, and on iTunes and YouTube. And if you dig this episode, be sure to check out the Demon Things website and the Demon Base catalogue, where you can search these bizarre and fascinating entities and learn more about them. So, without further ado, ladies and germs, Kasia Spikowska. Kasia, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure, actually. And um, before we get into the specifics and the Egyptological minute, so to speak, I'd like to kind of start in the prequel and get into how you first became interested in ancient Egypt and what about it attracted you to the kind of in-depth study of it? Well, it's interesting because a lot of my students tell me, oh, I've always wanted to be an Egyptologist and this is a dream come true. Uh, with me, it was a complete and utter fluke. I had absolutely no interest in it at all. I went to a university in the States and I started off as a world comparative literature major. And then I discovered philosophy and I went, oh, philosophy is great. And I became a philosophy of logic major. And then I discovered classical archaeology. And the university where I went to, San Francisco State University, had an Egyptian collection. And I took a class on history of uh, ancient Egypt just for fun, just for credit. And they took us as part of the class to the Egyptian museum. And I looked around and went, wow, this is so cool. And the curator said, well, you could always study Egyptian language and you could do the Egyptian history. And I said, really? And the minute I took a class in the Egyptian language, I hate to say it, but I ditched Greek <laughs> like a hot potato and just uh, basically lived in the museum. You couldn't get me out. I worked, ended up doing my, a special major in Egyptology using the departments of archaeology, anthropology, art history. I even did uh, ceramics because I was interested in pottery. And I thought, how can I study ancient Egyptian pottery unless I understand how pottery itself works? Mm. And I started, I did uh, the coursework for a museum studies degree and comparative religion as well. And I basically worked on seven exhibits there at the Egyptian collection. Wow. It sounds like you really had your hands full. That was just for the undergrad. Well, 
<laughs> and then I went to um, UCLA to, for, for grad school. And um, after taking some time off and realizing, yes, I really want to do this. And, uh, and uh, again, it was kind of a fluke. I thought, well, I'll try this. You know, who knows? Will I do my PhD? I don't know. And I ended up doing the PhD. So there you have it. <laughs> and was it like a smooth transition from the PhD into academic life or were there kind of time out periods and stuff like that? Well, I always worked because in the States we, we've always had large tuition fees. So I've, I've always worked my way through and I actually was really good at working with computers and instructional technology, which is how I worked my way through my MA and my PhD. And I gave myself one year after my PhD to find a job in academia. And I thought, if I don't get a job in academia, that's okay because I have a backup plan and I'll work with computers. And uh, right before that year was up, I got an interview at what was University of Wales, Swansea at the time. And lo and behold, again, as a fluke, I didn't expect to get the position here at all. <laughs> uh, I got the position in a brand spanking new Egyptology program that Amazing. had never been in existence before. So it was uh, it was really cool, and at the same time, I also had an offer to work with computers, so I had to weigh them up initially. Yeah. yeah. You know, which one do I want to do? Do I want to do the one that will earn me money, or the one that is kind of cool, actually? <laughs> <laughs> do you ever look back at those decisions? At any of those big moments? Yes. <laughs> I don't regret them, but there's certainly that was a major turning point. That was a major turning point. To me. Yeah. You know, going halfway around the, the world, basically, you know, yeah. to a new continent, a new culture. The uh, academic system here is so much more different than what I was familiar with than I ever could have imagined. And uh, so, so yeah, you look back, you know, that's a turning point. Yeah. You know? it, yeah. it was, um, but, I, but I find all those experiences really useful. And um it took me, you know, a while. We take longer going through education there in the U.S., but all of it comes into play. I mean, I had to take other ancient languages as well. I had to learn all five stages of Egyptian, plus I did Akkadian and Sumerian wow. as well. But it all helps. It all helps to understand, you know, that, that puzzle that's ancient Egypt. Mm, yeah. As, and it makes sense to do that as well, because I know a lot of the criticism that Egyptology gets is that it's treated as a field in its own distinct bubble, separate from the larger context of the ancient Near East and the ancient Middle East, which of course is crazy because there's evidence of trade between all of these <laughs> yeah. places as far back as pre-dynastic Egypt. So exactly, exactly. Yeah. And in terms of understanding things like religion, again, the the more you understand about the field that general area and and the practices in different cultures, the better questions you can ask of the ancient Egyptian culture and the broader your viewpoint instead of coming at it, you know, through a narrow lens, you sort of bring in different facets, different tools, different perspectives. And that I think really helps. Yeah, absolutely. So what attracted you to when you've got all this background in really hands-on stuff? I mean, Pottery, you know, that's almost experimental archaeology in itself, and people kind yeah. of do specialize yeah. in that area. And yeah. um, the language, again, is very hands-on because you're dealing with fragments of the past, whether, whether it be decipherment or trying to contextualize those things. Um, how does one end up looking at dreams and the Egyptian psyche from those things? That That's also another fluke. <laughs> um, <laughs> At the time, um, uh, my my first husband's father was a Jungian. Okay. And he was very involved with the Jung Institute in Switzerland and Zurich. And he actually asked me just out of curiosity one day, so what did the ancient Egyptians think of dreams? And I was doing my MA at the time. And I thought, well, that's a really good question. You know, I've been studying this for a long time now. And I read a lot of texts, and it's textual evidence mainly, of course, that will give us ideas about dreams because we don't have voice recordings um, from yeah. ancient Egypt. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I said, well, let me find out. And I asked a colleague who had been doing this longer than I had, and he said, oh, well, you know, they, they practiced dream interpretation a lot. And I thought to myself, well, that's odd. Again, I haven't yet come across a reference to that. In yeah. all the texts I've been reading, 
how common could it have been for me not to have come across it yet? Was it really common? And so I thought, well, let's look into it. And I realized the only thing that had been written on it was a very long article, but it was written in 1960. And a lot of it was based on um, Greek and Roman sources and ideas of Egyptian dreams. So their presentation of them, I thought, well, why don't I look and really sift through the Egyptian evidence and look at basically anything related to dreams. And that's the first thing you have to do is how do I recognize if it's a dream? Hmm. So the first thing I did was I, I found what words they used for dream and I had to set limits. So I said, well, okay, anything that is referred to when a person, if it, if a person saw it while they were asleep, that's a dream. Mm -hmm. If they use the word for dream, which is resut, and there's a second one, ked, if they use either of those words, I'll include that. Um, and uh, I'll look at bad dreams, too, because people always focus on good dreams and ignore sort of bad dreams. And actually, there was a lot more than uh, I thought there would be, especially because my supervisor at first was, oh, you won't find much on that. <laughs> <laughs> and lo and behold... It's always when you when you look, you don't realize until you really start looking and you yeah. start looking at material that is perhaps less um, attractive and mm. so hasn't been looked at as often. Um, it might be more difficult or it's, you know, bitty little pieces or it just hasn't been looked at through that lens, if I can call it that before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I mean, what kind of material were you looking at? Were these um, old papyri and, and things like that that you were translating, retranslating or... Yeah, every time I found a, a reference, I would retranslate that. So the earliest references we have are in Letters to the Dead. Mm -hmm. what, um, what period do they come from? Those come from the late Old Kingdom and First Intermediate period. So, I don't know, roughly 2100 BCE, I guess, is the earliest one. And we also find them in instruction texts. So these are texts that basically are written from the point of view of a man, an elite man speaking to his elite son mm -hmm. on how to behave in correct society. Mm -hmm. We find references in uh, literature as well, literary texts like tales as well as poetry. Uh, the first reference, you know, row, row, row your boat, life mm -hmm. is but a dream. Mm -hmm. In a Harper song from ancient Egypt, we find it said that life is but a moment of a dream. Huh. So that's the first instance of that. We also find references in spells. Yes. And those are spells not to bring good dreams, but to keep away nightmares. And that was an unexpected element. That was really unexpected. Um, as well as in execration texts, which are texts, which are lists of sort of negative uh phenomena mm -hmm. as well as peoples that would be inscribed on an object and then you break the object or you bury it to destroy the power and in those lists bad dreams are listed as well in some of them interesting then, so, it wasn't until after all that i finally came to a papyrus that was a book of dream interpretation <laughs> ah okay so after you've done all of that groundwork yeah and we also have a couple of references to people reporting their dreams um, and pharaohs where they see a fair, uh, god in a dream. So if I could just like step back a tiny bit, when you were looking for this stuff, why was it surprising? And I always try and ask the questions um, of an audience that might not be familiar with, you know, Egyptian yeah. culture to any degree. Yeah. Why would it yeah. be surprising to find the kind of evidence you found that was uh, helping protect or prevent bad dreams? What was it about that that was surprising? I think it's in part because um, we sort of look at the Egyptian world as a, as a bit idealized mm -hmm. and because they tend to focus on the positive aspects. So they yeah. don't dwell on the negative aspects. They always, you know, they always win every war. They don't, they don't, they don't lose battles. Mm -hmm. They would record that. So uh, you don't expect references to sort of negative things like bad dreams it was also uh, because those are sometimes called literally bad dream, 
but sometimes they're simply referred to things that come and attack you in the night. So I guess I was surprised to find them because I, I, if you just simply looked for references to bad dreams, you wouldn't come across so many texts that deal with keeping them away, yeah. if you know what I mean. Yeah. So that was surprising. Uh, also, I guess I expected more texts related to good dreams and bringing good dreams. And again, our idea of ancient Egypt is very much colored by the classical world. So we think mm. of incubation, temples where people go to dream, but those are very much uh, a phenomenon that didn't start until the Greek period. Right. Because so much of our picture of Egypt is distorted by the Greek view of Egypt and the later Roman view of Egypt. Exactly. And of course, the dream interpreters in the Bible as well, in Genesis. Well, absolutely. So, yeah. And this yeah. is one of the most famous stories that, you know, a lot of people, whether they've studied Egyptology or not, may have come across. I mean, it's a well-known story, the story of Joseph, the Technicolor dream coat, the, um, mm -hmm. the seer, the dream interpreter of the Pharaoh. Uh, does anything that you found tally up with any of those stories? I mean, the fact that they had dream interpretation to begin with, I suppose, is... One yeah. agreement. So they did it, but then it becomes a question of whether there's a specialist interpreter. Okay. Mm -hmm. And for that, um, I looked at the etymology of the word in the biblical sources and the Akkadian. It was really interesting because it came to this whole circular argument of um, the, the word that they referred that that is used is actually cheritep, which simply mm -hmm. means chief. Mm -hmm. And in this case, it's the chief priest. But because it's in a dream context, that word gets said to mean dream interpreter, but it actually doesn't at all. And uh, there is no word for a specialist dream interpreter, but it does seem to have been part of the sort of activities of a priest, especially in the um, Greco-Roman period. So we have an archive of a person by the name of Hor who lived in about 300 BCE. And his job was actually to not only interpret dreams, but he was also, he would dream for you. Hmm. <laughs> okay. But again, that's much, much, much later. Okay. The, the earliest papyrus that we have uh, that has a list of dreams and their interpretation, and it's more like a dream dictionary, in fact, than, okay. uh, than anything else, uh, is from the Ramesside period, so the, the time of Ramses II, and we don't know, um, we know who owned it, but we know that he certainly didn't write it because we have materials from that person in his own handwriting. He wrote a lot of things himself, and he wrote on the back of this papyrus, so we know that this papyrus that had the dreams and their interpretation, that was on there first the dream book, and then this guy wrote on top of it. And that tells you something as well. It's like, so, so how important was it? You know, did he use it? Did he just keep it in his library? He is an example of a person um, who did have a large archive, mm -hmm. and it was passed on actually to his family. It's a really interesting story, but that's <laughs> sort of to the side of what we're talking about. Uh, um, but as for a specialist dream interpreter, that's not until later. And as a matter of fact, in the Greco-Roman period, we even have an example of a text where uh, there's a sort of caption for an area and it says, you know, I'll you know, paraphrase extremely loosely and say, you know, dream interpretation here by a Cretan dream interpreter. Hmm. So there it's a Cretan who's doing the dream interpretation. Fascinating stuff. Uh, most of the dreams that we know of like prior to that book of dreams and their interpretation didn't require an interpreter. Mm -hmm. They were direct. So they were direct from the God to the King. What kind of dreams are we dealing with here? I mean, what, what kind of dreams are they talking about in these dictionaries and, and lists? Well, the, the list is kind of funny because most of it, it's not funny, funny. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, um, uh, was certainly composed by somebody who knew his ancient Egyptian very well, because a lot of it is based on puns. And that is a feature of book of dream books throughout the Mediterranean region mm -hmm. is, is the relationship uh, between on punning. So for example, if a man sees himself in a dream, 
eating the flesh of, flesh of a donkey, that's good. It means a promotion. And I sit there and go, well, what's the relationship there? Yeah. The relationship is the word for donkey in ancient Egyptian is something like ah, ah okay. which is onomatopoeic as well, the sound that a donkey makes. Yeah. And the word to become great or to be promoted is sa ah. So it's based on a pun. Mm. Some of the dreams that are listed there are ones that are familiar to people today. They had one if a man sees himself in a dream uh, with his teeth falling out. <laughs> Common anxiety him. dream, yes. <laughs> exactly. That's bad. It means, um, and I can't remember all of it, but it's something about his underlings. And there's a play there between the, the way the teeth fall out and they, they fall under, actually, and the underlings. Some of them are visual as well because the Egyptian language uh, and the Egyptian script, even when it's the handwriting, the hieratic, which mm. is what this was written in, allows for visual wordplay. Mm, yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, um, I should probably... Um, pull that out for a second, actually, because Egyptian puns, I guess, function in a slightly different way to the way that we in the West use puns now primarily for humor, whereas they 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 focus on similar sounding words quite often. But yep. it's not necessary that humor is intended so much as analogous no. parallels. Exactly. Um, yeah. And actually, uh, I wrote an article on it, and I specifically avoided, um, I wrote it with a colleague um, who specializes in puns, and we avoided the word wordplay, because right. we didn't want play in there. I mean, it is actually punning, and it has a religious significance, because a lot of them are at, or at um, can be read at two levels. Now, this particular papyrus is interesting also, because it includes within it a spell for keeping away bad dreams, and it includes within it a description of a personality type. Uh -huh. So. It starts off, um, it's broken at the beginning, and then you have a series of uh, a number of dreams that are uh, described as good. So each dream has what you see in a dream, a evaluation of the dream as either good or bad, and then what it means. So there's a series of good dreams, then there's a series of bad dreams, and then there's a description of a man, a type of man, and it says this type of man is called a follower of Seth. And he's described as uh, being physically brawny and uh, his hair is described as being red and even his eyebrow hair is red mm -hmm. and the hair under his arms is red. So he's a natural redhead and his personality is that of somebody who likes to drink, who likes to brawl, uh, somebody whom the women love and he's described as somebody who even though he is of the upper classes he basically acts like a commoner mm -hmm. so a bit of a lad in our terminology a bit of a lad exactly yeah. and this is the sethi amal with reference to the god set exactly often demonized in pop culture exactly okay yeah. yes yeah and then there's a heading and it says dreams of the follower of seth and then we have four dreams and then the text breaks off the papyrus is broken oh. <laughs> we're missing the rest so presumably there was a whole section and it would be so interesting yeah. to see if there would be different interpretations of the same thing or, but we'll never know. Yeah. What <laughs> kind of things do the followers of set dream yeah. about? I mean, yeah. naughty things, I guess. Is, yeah. is were, were they naughty things in the ones yeah. that are described? What, yeah. The four that are there, are they interesting? Uh, I think Freud would be disappointed. Uh, <laughs> Most of them are a little bit more mundane, and they really con seem to be concerned with the things that an upwardly mobile male of the urban society of ancient Egypt would be concerned with. So things like promotion, food, um, wealth. Uh, there's not much reference. There is some reference to the gods and divinity. There are some sexual references, but not that many, and the ones that are there are well you can tell their dreams and uh otherwise no freud freud wouldn't be happy was there a compliment to the the sethian male in a horus male because i think i've read that somewhere that... that's what people assume right remember i said that the beginning of the text is missing right so people assume that the beginning of the text would have read would have had perhaps a description of a follower of horus and then it might have said these are the dreams of the followers of horus but it's missing, so we don't know. 
Because that would put the whole thing in a slightly different light because it then turns from description into... I don't want to use the word propaganda because I don't think that's quite accurate, but it becomes an idealized notion of this follower of Horus is the kind of person you want to become in ancient Egypt rather than this awful, lecherous, Mm redhead person. It's Mm -hmm. funny to see, actually, as a side note, to see how the anti-ginger movement stretches back (laughs) as far as ancient Egypt. I I think it's really cruel. (laughs) I think it's really unfair. (laughs) Oh, and they make such a point of it too and i'm like really <laughs> yeah it does it does seem quite rough actually but you know but we don't know and and um the text is very specific it says um it, it's very specific in some ways and very vague in others so it, it says if a man sees himself in a dream and these do dream seem to be the dreams that a man would see mm-hmm. they don't seem to be concerned with uh, a woman right. and they make references to a man seeing his wife and his woman in other areas they're very vague so they don't often make references to specific gods yeah but for example they'll say if a man sees himself in a dream offering to his god which is nice because it, it implies that this would have been more generic and therefore could have been used by anybody, depending on which particular god you fancy. Right. And the same with the locations. It says a man of his town, so not specific. And I think um, that's really interesting. So it was made yeah. accessible to any man. But I mean, what, what do these things say about, I guess, two things, hierarchies and elites and mm-hmm. uh, gender what kind of inferences can we make about this being a written source, given how our understanding of Egyptian literacy levels are probably, it was probably very low compared to, so yeah, compared to the modern world. Yeah. And and again, it's always a question of what we mean by literacy. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. you know, literacy has different, different levels. There's understanding a language, there's speaking a language, there's reading and there's writing and writing always is the most difficult. Mm. Um, and even then you can copy but composing is probably the most difficult. Um, and it's difficult to say how these were used. In some cases, the use of man, depending on the dream, could be very generic just and be used in the same way as we say person. Mm-hmm. In other cases, it's very specifically speaking of a male. And uh, it, it's hard to know how this was used. So, you know, was this something if somebody would go to somebody who owns one of these, would they you know, look up (laughs) what the dream is, or is this a record of dreams Mm. that were seen and their possible interpretations? Mm. There are a couple instances in it where the same uh, thing is seen in a dream, but it's got a different interpretation. So that really also begs the question, was there some room for the interpreter there as well? There is another, uh, a few dream books. Um, There's a few of them. That's the earliest that are from later. And the later ones are actually really interesting because there uh, is one that has specifically the dreams that a woman might see. Ah. And there's a whole section that is, uh, is they're all sexual and they're all bad because they deal with her dreaming of having sex with, with people who aren't her husband. <laughs> right. I see. So, so again, we, we get this kind of insight into their cultural values from that yeah. though as well. It's kind of nice that in the Ramesside dream book, when women do appear, uh, they're not really treated in a derogatory way. Uh-huh. They are oftentimes act as partners, even in terms when they are referred to when a man sees himself in a dream um, having you know, sex with his wife. It's not in any sort of derogatory uh, way, which is, yeah. Um, yeah. it gets a little worse later on. <laughs> right. I was going to say, because, I mean, the, the female-led dream um manuscripts or papyrus uh what kind of period are we looking at for those uh roman roman okay Mm, yeah some of them are roman period and then a lot of them have you know they all have negative consequences and there's a whole series that deal with her giving birth to rather monstrous creatures as well whereas the whole idea of of in, in in the ramicide dream book the woman is not associated with giving birth that's not you know, she, she's treated, like I said, more as a, as a, well, as a partner, yeah. as a wife and, and, you know, as somebody to have sex with, but. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, Not, that does, that does tally with our understanding of, 
gender roles being perhaps less prescribed or, or harder to describe in the ways that they became later associated with in, in you know, Greek and Roman terms, yeah. certainly. Um, yeah. Is it also possible, though, that perhaps there were parallel traditions that that were slightly more appealing to different genders? I mean, we have things like recourse to the wise woman um, as a, shall we say, grassroots version, mm. a non-elite version of... Um, recourse to interpreters from the priestly caste, the elites. So if there's perhaps a grassroots version of those practices, is it possible that there's also slightly different kind of gender oh, take on these? Uh, there, there probably was. And it's interesting that you mentioned the grassroots because the, the wise woman, the only mentions we have of her are from that same time period. Mm, yeah. And she is mentioned also in relationship to a woman um, in a letter telling another person that she's going to see the wise woman about a dream that she's seen so there yeah i find it so fascinating because we we hear about the we have records of the elite version of these where you have a cult statue which yep. would be held up by priests and it would mm -hmm. you know dip a certain way mm -hmm. in response to certain questions posed by the supplicant going to you know going to pay tribute and ask the question of the god if these are the elite versions, is it possible that something of this comes back down through, or does it filter down, or is it going, you know, going from the, the ground way. up? And are they yeah. taking these things and turning them into um, elite resources? So it's a really fascinating cultural exchange, I think. So moving on from the the dream book, this is where, if I understand rightly, if my reading's right, you first come across the notion of what we're going to vaguely describe as demons. And I know you'll probably want to clarify that term, but this is where the notion of the, the demonology aspect of um, the project comes from. Is that right? Um, it actually came from not the dream book, but when I was working on dreams, um, it came from earlier references to uh, dreams keeping away or rather spells or rituals designed to keep away bad dreams. Right. Yeah. And the bad dreams initially sort of start as things that you can see or even things that watch you, which is really creepy, yeah. um, to things that actually attack you. And in fact, the earliest attested word for dream appears in a letter to the dead. And that letter to the dead, um, I should say these letters to the dead were written uh, sometimes on papyrus, but oftentimes on bowls as well or, and plates. And on the inside, sometimes they could even be circular and presumably they'd be left in a tomb with the offerings in there for the deceased. Right. So the offering, the deceased would, would consume the offerings and then, of course, find a letter there. Right. Uh, they're not like letters to loved ones like, oh, I miss you. They're more for help in this life and, you know. Hey, I'm having a property dispute and I can't get any help with <laughs> the worldly tribunal, so can you step in on my behalf? But in one of them, there's a guy by the name of Henny, and he's writing a letter to his dead father. And uh, in the letter, um, he starts off like all these letters do. Hey, hope everything's fine over there where you are. Uh, by the way, can you please stop your dead servant from watching me in a dream and uh you know even before that he says you know uh look it wasn't my fault that he was beat up i wasn't the first one to raise a hand against him wow. so can you please stop him and guard against him and protect me from him so the underlying assumption you know that, that you can read into this is that the servant is dead now, possibly from being assaulted, mm -hmm. from being beat up. This guy's protesting a little bit too much that he had nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. me, me thinks <laughs> but, the lady doth protest. Exactly. Yeah. But the dead is watching him in his dreams. So to me, it's like the earliest case we have of a guilty conscience, yeah. an anxiety dream caused by a guilty conscience. And that's the first time we have the word vasut, which is the Egyptian word for dream. Wow. And then out of this comes a literature dealing with entities, demons? Yeah. So I started um, uh, realizing that there's a lot of, again, spells that keep away things that can come during sleep. Mm -hmm. Because sleep 
is a time when you're very vulnerable. Mm. You're sort of, you know, on the verge of uh, this other world. And the dream was always perceived of as a thing in ancient Egyptian. You didn't do dreaming. It wasn't an activity. Arasut was a thing. It comes from the Egyptian word to awaken. So it's an awakening. Uh, and it, you would either see something in a dream or see something as a dream. And it seems like early on, these hostile, malevolent demons could watch you like Seni did. And then later on, they actually can come through the dream and fall upon you in the night. And you would have to drive them out in various ways. And those uh, sort of got me, I ended up getting really interested in these these nightmares instead of the, the good dreams. And in fact, we had far more, more references to bad dreams than there are to good dreams. Hmm. <laughs> uh, we don't have any real descriptions of them, unfortunately. Yeah. And again, that's in line with the Egyptians not wanting to write down anything negative. Yeah. The closest we get is like that dream of Henny where he's being watched in a dream. Or uh, there's one spell to keep away terrors that come to fall upon a man in the night. So again, the idea of something falling upon you, like mm -hmm. nightmares are often considered to do, because part of the, the sort of physical symptoms of an anxiety dream is that feeling that you can't move. You're paralyzed. There's something heavy on you. You can't breathe. You can't call out. Yeah, well, I was going to say that that relates so well to... Um... So my girlfriend has narcolepsy mm. and uh, it, it, it relates so well to stories of narcoleptics who have sleep paralysis. And actually, The, the Haunting of Hill House, the, the new Netflix show, covers this in, in um, some detail. But waking up in the middle of the night with night terrors, not being able to move because your body hasn't regained that link yet. That yep. hasn't woken up yet. So you, you physically can't move. You think you're psychologically awake and you can feel a weight and you're carrying bits of the dream with you. So you're seeing specters, quote unquote, at the foot of the bed or, you know, feeling a presence on top of you, feeling like, and this of course feeds into the later medieval uh, descriptions of things like incubi and succubi. Exactly. Dream demons. Exactly. Exactly. So, so potentially this goes back that far. Then, this yes. Notion. And remember I mentioned in the dream book, there's a section that has a spell. In that spell, it actually uh, it calls upon Isis and she says, I will basically, you know, drive out that within that which is within you with fire. And I will cause that your numbness may end. Mm -hmm. And that word for numbness, I take to be that feeling that you can't move. You can't feel your body. You want to, but you can't. Wow. Um, your dreams retire. And uh, she says, and the bad things which Seth, son of Nut, created will be driven out. So the idea, again, is that there's something inside you that can be driven out. Wow. You know, and then it goes away. That's so, conceptually, that's really interesting. Because if, if dreaming isn't something we do, but something that is put upon us, what does that say about the Egyptian view of negativity to begin with? Is it? Mm. It's yeah. It's from the outside, yeah. And they're very specific too. Like they had a different word, just like we do in English. We have a different word for to see something and to look at something. Uh -huh. One is a conscious decision. You have to make a conscious decision to focus your gaze on something. But we oftentimes see things whether we want to or not, and the word for seeing things in a dream is usually to see. So you have no control over it. It's you'll, you'll see it whether you want to or not. And that tells us a great deal uh, also. And that, that lack of control stays with the idea of, of dreams in terms of the good dreams as well. And in terms of the bad dreams, it was interesting when you, when you said seeing specters at the foot of the bed, because that's one of the ways I think we recognize time periods where certain individuals certainly seem to have had more needed more protection from nightmares and other bad dreams and malevolent you know demons let's say or malevolent beings because we find the beds and the firm furniture decorated with protective guardians in, oh. including the foot and the head of the bed the legs of a bed um the sides of chairs the the bases of chairs as well as even the headrests which were the ancient egyptian version of a pillow and what kind of entities are they or what kind of figures or things yeah. are they are they putting on these to protect them against these nightmares those i 
annoyingly, I chose to call them demons as well, but they're benevolent demons. They're good right. demons. They're helpful right. demons or guardians. We just don't have a good name for them, protectors. Sometimes they take the form of the Bez figure, who is that uh, rather well-known sort of oftentimes described as a bandy-legged dwarf facing forward, sometimes with his tongue sticking out, um, you know, little cookie lion ears and, and a mane and a tail, sometimes with the hippo lion, or she's not even a hippo lion, she's the rearing hippo with what might be crocodile scales down her back, uh, which we often call Taweret. But again, in this case, it, it's not necessarily her. Hmm. That imagery can be used by different beings, so I prefer not to name it, you know, Taweret. I call it the hippo thing. Uh, <laughs> some, <laughs> sometimes there are other beings which have sort of the body of the Bez type guy, but the head of a crocodile or the head of uh, a dog. Um, oftentimes they're wielding weapons. And those weapons include spears. They include snakes being held like maces. They include knives. They include snakes coming out of their mouths. Hmm. They even include knives on their feet. And that is a feature I have not seen in any other religion or mythology yet. Um, if anybody knows of any, I would love to hear them. But as far as I know, that is an idiosyncratic feature of the representation of these supernatural beings in um, New Kingdom, ancient Egypt. And I've only seen it there. Knives on feet. That's fascinating. So, I mean, could you tell us about some of the, that's obviously quite an unusual entity because we don't see yeah. that anywhere yeah. else really. Yeah. Um, Apart from, I guess, in the animal kingdom, where big cats, for instance, yeah. will rake their prey with their hind feet. Yeah. But... And in some cases, these these benevolent demons or supernatural beings are in the shape, actually, of big wild felines. Again, I'm being unspecific because it's difficult. They don't seem to mean to be uh, portraying specifically a lion or specifically a leopard, but the, the concept of a wild yeah. canine. Yeah. And some of them are upright um and uh, are wielding these on all four paws. And what what are the more, I guess, what are the most unusual of these things? And do you have any favorites? I do. I like the. There's a bunch that are little that are rabbits, um, <laughs> and I just find the idea of a of a butcher knife wielding rabbit somehow. <laughs> <laughs> somehow. I don't know. It tickles my fancy. It's not actually a rabbit. They're hares, of course. Right. And hares can be really vicious when they fight as well. Yeah. Um, there's uh, uh, frogs also, giant eyes that, that have big knives. Uh, some of the strangest one I call a red hot chili pepper. I know it's not, but it looks like a chili pepper. And um, it's got two little hands two little stubby stubby arms or hands and it's got a knife in each one and and a head kind wow. of a dog that appears in the middle kingdom coffin texts so there's just this <laughs> <laughs> just this litany of composite yeah things yeah loosely yeah. loosely termed things some of which seem to be benevolent and some of which and do they ever represent because as you've said, it's unusual for the Egyptians to write down or represent anything negative or harmful because yeah. that's that's just not how they did mm. history, so to speak, in air quotes. Um, but do they ever represent the negative forces? The, in fact, almost almost all the images we have, even though they're scary looking and creepy looking and weird looking, and, and yeah, they're, they're, they can be combinations of objects, humans, and animals, um, they're almost all actually helpful. They're all protective guardians. Um, in general, the malignant sort of uh, negative beings are either portrayed in human form and they're bound. So we find them in the tombs of the pharaohs of the New Kingdom. You'll find images of these beings upside down, oftentimes naked. So they have their clothing has re been removed, so they have no status. They've they often have no genitals, so they can no longer have offspring. And they're often bound, so they can't hurt you, oftentimes upside down as well. Um, 
or in the process of being tortured in various ways, sometimes decapitated. In other words, they can't hurt you. The exception is we have except uh, in the Middle Kingdom, we have a really interesting malevolent being because he's given a name and parentage and he's depicted. Wow. In the same way as he's described. Most of the malevolent beings we have descriptions of. So uh, one who comes in through the night with her head turned backwards, Ooh. for example, and oftentimes references to them being uh, backwards or wrong in some ways, or they're just generically referred to as murderers or uh, passers-by or uh, adversaries. Again, the idea of somebody opposite. Uh, but this guy, his name is Sahakek, and he actually appears in spells to ward away headaches. Hmm. And I guess he causes the headaches. And I, you know, you, we've all had headaches. We know it feels sometimes like somebody inside of you drilling, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or pounding a hammer, or <laughs> um, various things like that. And uh, he's actually got parentage. His parents are both named. And he are said they demons. He, they are of foreign origin. Ooh. Of course, blame of course. it on the foreigner. Something <laughs> still happens today. And uh, there's even a female counterpart to him who is not depicted, but she is named and she has parentage as well from the same time period. Her name is Isheshi. So again, you notice in both those names, you have a repetition, Sahakek yeah. and Isheshi. And there's something there also with that repetition, um, either being a reference to it being a foreign name, because Isheshi also has foreign parents, yeah. uh, or the fact that they're malignant beings. It's really interesting because often, and not always, but often with the gods, when we have a coupling and uh, a complementary pair, their names will reflect each other. So is there something in going on in that that we might be missing because, again, of the, this concept of the pun or some kind of other reference that we're not yeah. getting that would have made sense to them at the time. Perhaps. And I think definitely there is something when you said the, the gods, because the gods often come in threes, the major gods, mm. not all the rest of the gazillion godlets or <laughs> demon things and supernatural beings, but the, the major ones come in, come in uh, 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 mother, father, child. Yeah. And that's exactly what happens with these named ones because otherwise again these are the only ones that have an individual names yeah. and so they're sort of the the malevolent version of the benevolent uh nuclear family right so <laughs> they have an offspring as well who's like the godling of headaches no the the guy himself is a child oh he's sorry right so, so he's the, the child the child and he has parents yeah right. yeah and sheshi is a is described as a female child as well and she has parents do we know the parents' names or is there? Yes. Yeah, I can't remember them off the top of my head because right. they're always really convoluted and, um, again, emphasizing their foreignness. So they're written out more syllabically. And that's the way the Egyptians oftentimes coped with foreign names as they wrote them out syllabically. Right. I see. And she's not depicted. Sahakik is only depicted once on one ostracon, on one scrap of clay. And he is depicted the way he is described, too. He's described as having one four limb and it's actually described as a four limb as opposed to a hand so again that emphasizing the sort of otherly nature um, of his as having one on his brow and he's actually described as being rather anti-order so he's described as um enjoying eating his own feces uh which mm -hmm. is often a way that uh the malevolent divinities or beings not divinities but the malevolent beings are described again as reversed and upside down i suppose it's probably um it's probably good to highlight as well that to the egyptians of course having spells against this kind of thing fits their daily world view in a way that we don't have an equivalency so it wouldn't be unusual to have something like this it wouldn't be esoteric or occult to oh, no. engage no, these practices. 
No, absolutely not. That sort of distinction between magic and religion, that is a feature of much later times in, in Egypt and in Sumeria and in, in the Akkadian world, the Canaanite world. And, and in fact, in, in many cultures, religion is a part of life. Mm. That's, that's just a part of it. It actually even happens today in some Christian cultures. I mean, my own, I remember talking to my uncle in Poland at one point, and he talked to me of a vision he had of Mary. And he was quite, you know, this, this happened to him. This, this was not, you know, she actually came to him mm. and he fully believed it. Uh, the numinous, you know, the, the, the divine world is all around you all the time. And uh, when I was young, too, they told me not to walk through the local graveyard um, because the spirits would come and steal me. And, you know, my aunt was quite serious and she shut the windows and so nobody can come get in at night. Not physical person. <laughs> But again, shutting out the spirits, and this was a real belief of a of a tangible, the tangible nature of the divine. Yeah, it's it's such a, it's, I think it's such an important thing to bear in mind because we so often look at ancient Egyptian civilization from the top down. Yeah, and and we see it from its monumental perspective, from its elite and royal perspective, and we don't really think about the daily realities. Yeah of life for the Egyptians and what their concerns were, were, and not only what their concerns were, but what their reactions, what their responses, yeah. responses to affliction, yeah. as, as John Baines yeah. puts it, you know, yeah. how did That's they right. cope? What were their yep. mechanisms? And I think yeah. there's a lot more crossover there because everyone, I think, has more in common than they have different. That's right. Irrespective of, of social hierarchy, I suppose, or social layering. So I think it'd be really interesting to, oh, I just, I hope for all our sakes that we find more contexts of this stuff in the future and we can make, you know, more extrapolations on, mm. on how people were using this in their daily lives. But I would definitely recommend uh, Kasha's work if you want to get an insight into the Egyptian mindset with respect to dream forces and what that really says about the Egyptians in those periods, at the very least. Is there, is there any particular work um, that you would want to point people to if they were interested in following this up and look, looking into demon, demon things, so to speak? Yeah, yeah. Well, I have a website, Demon Things, which if anybody would like to volunteer to help keep up, with it, <laughs> that'd be welcome for the help. Um, you heard it here, but folks. There's, yeah, there's uh, information there as well as I do have a book on dreams, but again, I need to republish it. Yeah, I'm happy to put links. I'll put links in the show notes so that people can follow up and visit the yes. website and yep. um, see the, the books uh, that you and have on these subjects. I've got a nice one on daily life where I mention it a little bit, but um, yeah. fuller work is uh, forthcoming. Excellent, excellent. Well, so what kind of uh, what kind of work is coming out of the dream research with the work that you're doing in outreach programs in museums and things like that? Well, recently I've been doing a series of events that uh, my PhD student, well, she's not anymore my PhD student, she's now a doctor, right. Dr. Susanna Bennett, she um, came up with the idea of having a demon creation station. So we started to make demon creation stations and uh, at museums and various events. We've been part of the British Science Festival, the Swansea Science Festival, the Being Human Festival. Uh, and the Festival of Humanities, and the Ashmolean Museum, the Superheroes Night. We basically have kids uh, write up or color or pick one of the ancient Egyptian beings that they would find protective. And we do sort of, um, we've done lots of different things. Like like uh, one time, uh, well, this last time, I we had made up these wands, these ancient Egyptian wands, the shape of them. Um, and they say protection by day and protection by night on them. And then the kids could fill in the wand with images of protective beings. And I introduced them to some of the ancient Egyptian ones as well that they could then color in. And we asked them why they picked that particular one. Mm. And they write down, you know, why did you pick that one? What did you like about it? And uh, it, it's, it's kind of interesting because remember I mentioned the frog one with the big knife? that's one of the favorites oh really <laughs> yeah yeah and again i'm not you know, do they I'm say kinda, why he's one of the favorites yeah some of them because it's friendly for each one i give a little bit of information about what 
specific aspect they're meant to protect. And in one of them, uh, the 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 um, child wrote, you know, they liked it because because he's you know helpful to children. Another one, oh, because he you know he's he's very fierce and protective, and he has a big knife, so he'd help me a lot. Uh, so it's pretty interesting. And one uh, that feeds into my research as well. Remember, I mentioned we have maybe I didn't mention. In some cases, we have names of of these beings. In some cases, we have images. And in only a few do we have both an image and a name where we know they match. So what I did was I had a selection of the images and a selection of names and had them match up which one they thought had which name just to see what kind of, again, emotions uh, these beings provoked, you know, because that's always the question is why, you know, why a frog? Mm. But here's all these kids who find the frog kind of accessible and helpful. So if they did. You know, maybe it worked in Egypt as well, or it might be for some other reason, of course. But, but it's um, it's pretty interesting, actually. It's it's it's, uh, and they remember the stuff too, and they really remember. And there's definitely patterns, and they're different than the ones that the adults pick. Interesting. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So it so might got... might tell us something about the associations that we pick up yeah, as we go through yeah. life. Yeah, and as I always say with my mind, it's kind of like the only way we have of looking into the mind mm. of the Egyptians through the archaeology. And, and when you mentioned before the mind of the elite, it wasn't, you know, if Tutankhamun himself had his headrest decorated and his bed, so even the pharaohs had anxieties and afflictions, you know, that they needed sort of supernatural help with as well as uh, more ordinary people. So. Fascinating stuff. Kasia, thank you so much for coming thank on you, and Paul. talking to us about um, dreams and demons today. And I definitely want to have you back to talk about some of the other research, because I know there's a lot going on. And I know that you've, <laughs> you've got like, you know, a thousand balls in the air of different kind of projects my and stuff like that. My cobras. My cobras <laughs> yes, we, want to, <laughs> we need to talk about the cobras. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for coming on. And uh, again, I will put links in the show notes so that people can find this stuff, find the website, check it out. And, you know, check out the, uh, the dreams and the demons. And uh, we'll sign off with that. Thanks. Thank you. Fortune and glory, kid. Fortune and glory. Since this show is free and I want to make sure it stays that way, I will be introducing some ads over the course of the next few months. So please bear with me as I do that. Any show like this is a lot of work and, of course, it's unpaid. But if you like the show, you can support it by sharing, subscribing and reviewing on platforms like iTunes and generally helping spread the word. This episode is brought to you by Close Up Presenting. Close Up is a company of my own creation, which I started basically to scratch my own itch. Now, what makes Dr. Paul Harrison itch, I hear you cry? Well, when I first graduated from my PhD, there wasn't a lot of academic work on the ground. So I sidestepped into media, starting with presenting work. The problem for me was that even though I knew my subject area really well, I didn't have any formal training on camera, and I'd sometimes freeze and go blank or get nervous and fumble during important moments. In order to address this, I spent years and small fortunes taking presenter classes, acting classes, and even saw a voice specialist to help up my game and get confident on camera and microphone. Now, I eventually graduated to working as a producer for a private investment TV channel. And I noticed that a lot of the financial specialists there had the same problems I'd once had, and sometimes much worse. And because they couldn't enjoy the process, they'd put it off, get more nervous, and feed a vicious cycle that I knew we had to break. These were extremely smart, competent people who knew their subject area. But once a camera was put on them, they might freeze or stutter or not know where to look or know what to do with their arms or bodies. They would also compound the issue by writing these long technical reports, which didn't work as scripts. Things written for the eye don't often work for the ear. So I took it upon myself to instigate a table read process to fix those scripts. And during these, I started to tutor them in how to present on camera. And lo and behold, with a little bit of knowledge and all important practice, they actually started to enjoy the process. Now this helped smooth relationships between departments and meant they'd actually show up on schedule, even excited to record shows, all of which made it much better for everyone involved. After I left that company, I wrote down all the common pain points for people and wrote a course especially aimed at subject experts, be that from science, finance, history, or pretty much any background. I did this to help people who want to get on camera and appear as professional as they truly are in their areas of expertise. 
but without having to spend the years and fortunes I spent getting practice to this. So if you need to be on camera for work, you do a lot of presentations, or perhaps you're a thought leader or aspiring science communicator, then this course is aimed at you. It's broken down into manageable topics with self-testing and assessment so you can track your progress, and it comes with a 30-day money-back full guarantee, so there's nothing to lose. I also have a special deal for listeners. If you input the code PROFANE, that's P-R-O-F-A-N-E in capitals, you'll get a special listener discount. It's hosted at close-up-presenting.teachable.com and the link is in the bio or show notes. And right now we're having a huge Thanksgiving Black Friday mega sale. If you input the code Black Friday 2018 or one word or caps, you'll get a ridiculous 90% off. But this offer lasts only a week from today. That's until Friday 29th of November. So check that out help keep the show going, and help keep my cat in the manner of lifestyle she has become accustomed to, with all the dreamies she can eat. So I'll put those notes in the link so you can check that out and spread the word, even if it's not for you. Okay, thank you guys. Catch you next time. That's sadly all we have time for today, but be sure to check back in for new episodes which continue to explore manifestations of the ancient world in the modern, including interviews with a bevy of archaeologists and Egyptologists, cometics and reconstructionists, and key players in historical entertainment, including authors, filmmakers, actors, and game designers. If you like the show, please subscribe and rate it on your preferred platform and tell all your friends. I've been Dr. Harrison, and this was the Profane Egyptologist Podcast. Thanks for listening.